are you doing here? Why didn't you follow him? Why didn't you pursue him? Where were the reinforcements you promised me? Don't you dare criticize me! Don't you dare! Don't you see if Wellington's free to choose his ground, everything I've won in this campaign, you've lost? Guys, welcome to a classic film review of 1970s war epic, Waterloo. Now, this stars Rod Steiger as the infamous Emperor of France, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Christopher Plummer as British General Arthur Wellesley, uh, the Duke of Wellington. Director Sergei Bondarchuk's Italian-Russian co-produced historical epic is one of the most lavish productions. Now, made on a huge budget for 1970 uh, of $25 million, it presents still spectacular action sequences, uh, jaw-dropping widescreen cinematography, uh, with costume and production requirements that still boggle the mind. Now, Waterloo is up there with some of the most epic examples of cinema ever made. Its cast featured 20,000 soldiers and a full brigade of Soviet cavalry, as well as a wide-eyed and desperate performance from Rod Steiger as Napoleon Bonaparte. Let's take a look. So 1970s Waterloo opens on the eve of Napoleon's defeat and banishment to Elba Island in 1814 uh, and follows him through his escape 10 months later and on through his return to power in France and the beginning of the War of the Seventh Coalition or the 100 Days War uh, and of course on to his final defeat in 1815 at Waterloo. Now although the film initially follows Napoleon it's not really a character study per se and therefore spends almost equal amounts of time with Christopher Plummer's Arthur Wellesley, uh, the Duke of Wellington, who for ease I'll just call Wellington from this point on. On that promise, Lord Duke, Blucher would tie his men to trees if necessary. These four roads here. Quatre bras. He's bound to go for them, sir. If we can't hold him there, I'll stop him here. And the movie is really focused on meticulously depicting the Battle of Waterloo, a colossal military face-off between the French and a British-led force that was joined by three corps of the Prussian army. Uh, now, this video won't delve too deeply into any kind of military tactical analysis, quite simply because I don't really know a thing about it. <laughs> so it is important to note, though, that Waterloo was directed by Sergei Bondarchuk, whose magnum opus is his seven-hour adaptation of War and Peace from 1965. Uh, so knocking up a two-hour and 12-minute movie about just one battle probably felt like a small production to him. However, I can assure you that this is no small production. Uh, this is filmmaking of staggering scope, and like I may probably repeat more than once, there's no digital crowd simulation here. There's no digital landscape manipulation. This is a crew on location with just short of 18,000 extras. God knows how many horses. It's no exaggeration to say it's genuinely jaw-dropping in scale. Now, I think it may still hold the record for most costumed extras ever on a movie project. And it all looks stunning, of course. Uh, endless battlefields photographed with just the right balance between polished movie and documentary realism by Armando Nanuzzi, who was also the director of photography on 1977's Jesus of Nazareth miniseries. Uh, just take a look at the famous 1881 painting, Scotland Forever, by Lady Butler, and then it's staging in the film as the Royal Scots Greys charge. Now, I love the way the film balances the mania of Rod Steiger's Napoleon uh, as he paces about the battlefield, yelling orders and desperately trying to break down the British line. Uh, and then there's Plummer's Wellington, hilariously stiff upper lipped, and he knows it would be far too ungentlemanly to lose his cool in the heat of battle, even surrounded by just outrageous violence. Ah, uh, expert. As I am second in command, and in case anything should happen to you, what are your plans? To beat the French. Now, the film's essentially split into two parts. Uh, the first, fast forward through the 100 days between Napoleon's return from exile and him setting foot on the battlefield in what is now Belgium uh, on Sunday the 18th of June, 1815, uh, to face his nemesis, Wellington. Now, what Waterloo isn't, to be honest, is a character study of either military mind. Uh, both Napoleon and Wellington here are a bit like us, the audience, just onlookers to the monumental chaos around them. Uh, Sergei Bondarchuk is really only interested in showing us uh, the biggest spectacle he can possibly fit onto the screen. Uh, the entire second hour of the movie is, as the title promises, dominated by the colossal battle at Waterloo. And here, Bondarchuk throws every filmmaking toy and trick his budget allows. Uh, we have 
zoom ins and fast pans, uh, crane shots and helicopter shots and more. And it's thrown all together in the editing room at such a pace that there really isn't time to notice that some of the 4,000 extras are actually cardboard cutouts or mannequins dressed up in uniform. So yeah, there is a tiny bit of pre-CGI trickery involved, but not in the breathtaking aerial shots of infantry squares uh, smoothly forming or coming under attack from cavalry. And I think in some of these sequences and others during the battle, several horse falls were cut for the UK by the BBFC. We'll come back to some of that amazing horse wrangling in Waterloo in just a few moments, but first we have to talk about the cast, and of course we'll kick it off with Rod Steiger's portrayal of Napoleon Bonaparte, the part that Joaquin Phoenix took on in Ridley Scott's recent biopic. Now, I will say that, in my opinion, Steiger does a commendable job in the role, as does Plummer as his nemesis, but the movie doesn't really require a great deal from them both, uh, just for them to be present at the battle. Uh, Bondichuk isn't fashioning an in-depth psychological analysis of the men, or requiring us to have a great emotional connection to them either way. This movie starts as Napoleon's forced to abdicate in his exiled to the island of Elba with a thousand men, which is Steiger's opportunity early on to flex his acting chops before the mass spectacle takes over. I found it in the gutter and I, I picked it up with my sword. Uh, and before you know it, he's back on the mainland, rallying his troops and chasing out King Louis XVIII to take command. Uh, King Louis, by the way, is played here by none other than Orson Welles, who by 1970 was more of a talk show guest than an actual film star or filmmaker. Anyway, this kick started the 100 Days War and led both Bonaparte and Wellington uh, to end up eyeballing each other from afar across a colossal battlefield of just unimaginable violence, where in only a single day nearly 50,000 men were killed or wounded. Now, throughout all of this, both Steiger, who seesaws between wild-eyed and manic, or going off on the sick, um, and Plummer, all noble and suave, and far too much of a gentleman to believe this is anything but an afternoon of pleasant victory. Clever chap, your tailor, hey? Dunmore and Locks, in St James, your grace. Remind me of that, Delancey. I always like my men well-dressed. For the enemy. And such is the scope and chaos on offer here that I almost forgot Jack Hawkins is also in this movie as General Sir Thomas Picton. Uh, the rest of the cast is fleshed out with actors such as Virginia McKenna, uh, Rupert Davis and Terence Alexander. Now it has a bombastic score by Nino Rota whose next two scores would be Fellini's Roma and Coppola's The Godfather. So yeah, maybe you've seen Ridley Scott's recent movie and fancy seeing how it was done 54 years ago. And I'd be remiss not to mention Abel Gantz's five and a half hour version of Napoleon made almost 100 years ago now in 1927, which was apparently only part one of an unfinished six part mega saga. But anyway, if you're a fan of war movies, um, epic battle scenes or even just historical epic cinema or in Swedish pop supergroups in the Eurovision Song Contest, then this deserves to be on your watch list. Go check it out. So there's the great thief of Europe himself. Your Grace, Napoleon has ridden within range. May I have your permission to try a shot? Certainly not. <laughs> 